very unique, unique guest today. We have Andy Schultz on the podcast here, and he's the assistant director of baseball and business operations for minor league baseball. So we got um, one of the upper management here of not major league baseball, but minor league baseball. And to be honest with you, minor league baseball is kind of the lifeblood of major league baseball. And, you know, people who know the game truly do know that. And Andy was a uh, umpire supervisor and evaluator from 2007 to 2010 before starting at his uh, current position. And he's also been involved in a uh, multitude of other aspects of baseball in terms of minor leagues and uh, umpiring, and we'll get into all that. So, Andy, thank you for uh, coming on. Thanks for taking your time. How you doing? I'm doing good. I, absolutely. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, nice to meet you and be part of this. Absolutely. So, real quick, basic question to start off. How did you get into professional baseball? What uh, first steps did you have to take? You know, I, I – uh, I was not a, you know, most everyone that you talk to that, that won a career in professional baseball, um, you know, go to school to, to get a sports management degree or get a hospitality degree or get a business degree. Uh, I actually was a, a music major at Kutztown University in, in Eastern Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. And, but while I was going to school, my summer job was, was umpiring. I was umpiring, you know, little league where I grew up, um, it wasn't technically called Little League, but I, until I, I got done with college in 1995, for those those four years, I did, you know, 10-year-olds up to, to American Legion ball and some men's summer league ball, too, as I got a little more experience. So I just I just started umpiring. It, it just kind of clicked inside me. It was something that was fun, and I really liked it. And I actually met someone that, that went to professional umpire school years before, and he kind of said, did you ever think about doing it? So about halfway through my my college time, I decided that, you know, when I'm done with college, I, I'm going to go to umpire school. So lo and behold, in January of 1996, I attended the Jim Evans Academy of Professional Umpiring. Uh, there were three umpire schools at that time. One was run by Jim Evans, a former major league umpire. Uh, other was run by uh, Harry Wendelstadt, who now that school is now run by his son, Hunter. And then the third school was run by Jim uh, Joe Brinkman and uh, – uh, Holy cow. Uh, 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 Bruce Fremming. Brinkman okay. Fremming. Went to umpire school in 96, not knowing anything about professional baseball other than going to Reading Phillies games and Harrisburg Senator games and just, you know, just growing up following baseball. And lo and behold, I got a job as an umpire in 1996, was hired at, at the rookie level, uh, Gulf Coast League. And over the course of the next eight years, I climbed the ladder of umpiring. Uh, rookie ball, low A, high A, double A, triple A. Uh, got a a couple fall assignments uh, here in, in Arizona and Florida was assigned one year to go to uh, Australia for what a league was called then the international baseball league, Australia uh, back in uh, December of uh, 2000 and January, 2001. And then was fortunate enough to get assigned to the Dominican winter league, which was an absolutely incredible experience. Uh, once I yeah. came back there, I was, I've heard some I, great stories about that league. I, oh, it, it's incredible. I mean, the, the, the fans and, and um, I didn't really appreciate it until after I got out of there because when I was there, it was after my first year in AAA, I was just trying to survive. You know, I, 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 I didn't speak Spanish and uh, just trying to live down there with, with three other Americans uh, in a hotel right. in Domingo. But I got to tell you, man, it was an experience that I would never trade in for a million years. I, I was proud to have worked the plate in game seven of the finals. One of the greatest baseball games I've seen in my entire life. Um, it made me a much better umpire. Did I get to the big leagues? No, but I got a heck of a lot farther than, than other people that have gone down the path uh, that I did. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's because of that experience that, that that's got me where I am today. But uh, yeah. my time, like, question you asked how did I get started in baseball it was umpiring and then learning to grow and develop from there right and so I so quick kind of like side question is like what's kind of like a differentiator between baseball in America and even Australia and like the DR like when you're down there like is it is it just like the atmosphere the passion or the people showing out like what is it yeah well, you know, in Australia, they were trying to grow the game then. Dave Nielsen, who played in the big leagues, uh, he was with the Brewers, he was with the Red Sox. Dave created this league back in, in uh, the fall of, of uh, 2000 in Australia. 
And basically, they were trying to get you know lower level prospects. I would say maybe A ball prospects. Uh, bring them to Australia. The weather was beautiful there. We were in the the east coast of Australia in Queensland, and um, uh, it was it was American prospects. Uh, and then they also had the Australian kind of, I guess, kind of a pseudo national team. They had a Korean pseudo national team. So really four teams going on there, and we were playing on cricket pitches and and not even in formal baseball stadiums. I mean, this was still kind of a growing sport there in Australia. So right. there was, but it was more curiosity than anything else. Now, Dominican Republic, I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, we, we've watched, you know, you see South American soccer games, you see European soccer games with the, the chants and the, and the flags and the horns. That's exactly what it was like down in Dominican. That's um, awesome. It, it's a short season. You know, they play from mid-October until about New Year's, and then their playoffs go the month of January, kind of a round-robin tournament that leads into uh, the championship series. And um, as you get closer to those playoffs, more and more big-time big league players play. Um, so that the excitement is there from the get-go. And, and it's that, the, you know, the best players that, that are from the Dominican that, that get to go play in the States – they're playing in the Dominican Winter League, so right. um, it was it was absolutely amazing. I mean, flags and horns, and you know they throw some stuff on the field every now and then. <laughs> Unfortunately, they hit with anything, but yeah, um, you know it was crazy. I, real quick story: it's it's early in the season, and we're up in um, up in Santiago, and Santiago had a full uh, full uh, three hundred and sixty degree stadium, so sat seated about twenty to twenty five thousand people. And there was an American player that, that just got to the league a couple couple of weeks into the league, and it's his first at bat, and he's going to dig into the batter's box. There's a there's a mariachi band out in the stands in left field. I mean, blowing horns and playing drums. Mm-hmm. This is not a loudspeaker. This isn't coming from the press box. This is just a bunch of guys in the uh, in the outfield. And he's digging in, and he steps out, and he's just kind of waiting. And I'm like, all right, come on, shooter, we need you. We need to get going here. He's like, well, they're still playing the music. I said. Brother, welcome to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> game. So it's just something that you had to get used to. I mean, um, players and managers, they, they would wear your clubs, especially during the during the playoffs. It was just it was insane. I mean, they would pack more people into the stadium than they could hold. Right. And the noise was deafening. Um, it wasn't until I could get through maybe the top of the first or the bottom of the first inning that I could finally just kind of get into a zone and block everything out. Um, you know, pregame, we're in the locker room, and the noise that's coming from outside, you know, down through the stands into our locker room was, was still pretty loud. So it was, it was pretty intimidating. But like I said, it, it was an experience I would never trade. Yeah. I did the big leagues, but to have that experience and get that close, uh, it was pretty amazing. So the passion down there is, is and it's, you know, it's better now than it, it's even been then. And that was 20 years ago when I umpired down there. So. Right. Uh, the fact that you know we're going to have more and more players going to the Hall of Fame from the Dominican Republic. You know, there's only a few of them now, and and uh, it's it's going to keep growing. And uh, you know, most of our best players in Major League Baseball have Dominican heritage in them. So uh, it's it's a really incredible place to be. Absolutely, and you know, I, I've heard like stories like that with the music and the chants. So I, that's why I asked you because I wanted to know like you know your personal experience with that, and that was. That was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to hear because I've heard ex- exactly the same kind of like along those lines, um, just of the uh, energy that's you know in that league. Um, uh, so passion, yeah. passion is. You want to talk about passion? You know the way yeah. Americans are football in the NFL, like that kind of passion. Especially if you're a college football fan that have that type of connection. That's what it's like down there. The passion is just it's just through the roof. Right. So now, as an umpire. Now, shifting more towards the modern game, I know you're kind of talking about, you know, um, a couple of years ago when you were umpiring, but now in today's uh, game, how do you feel about the game possibly shifting over to uh, robotic umpires? And what are those discussions like when, you know, people like yourself or people in other positions have to kind of discuss and weigh those options? You know, it's, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that comes out of, the, the rulemaking and how the adjustments are coming to professional baseball, it trickles down from major league baseball. And, and we, you know, we work hand in hand with them as best, as best we can. Uh, but with, 
you know, with them implementing the technology and with the expense that comes with it, MLB, you know, pretty much puts it in place. You know, give you an example. We started a few years ago with, uh, we've got pace of game clocks at the AAA and AA level and at the Florida State League. Uh, that was an expense that, that Major League Baseball took on themselves as far as installing these clocks at, at all those ballparks. Uh, as far as the, the operator of the clock, you know, that's a, that's a minor league expense. But uh, this is, you know, this was, it's, it's the idea that MLB is, is accepting the fact that, that we're turning the corner and, and starting to really modernize baseball in comparison to, you know, hockey, soccer, football, so on and so forth. Right. Um, you know, as an umpire, you know, that I, I have discussions. I still umpire college baseball today, but, but as an umpire, there's, there's a lot of back and forth, you know, you don't want to have your job taken away from you as an umpire. Um, you know, I, I'm still, I still get excited about going on the field. And I wonder to myself, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where, there's not going to be a person there on the field, but, but I do believe sooner than later and, and within the next couple of years, we're going to have, um, we're going to have a machine calling balls and strikes. Uh, okay. Major Football partnered with the Atlantic league this past year to, to give it a try. And clearly they need the time to work out the kinks because there was some, obviously there were some issues down there, uh, in the Atlantic league and, um, uh, you know, just, trying to figure out how that strike zone set up, how you get, you know, get it consistent from top to bottom on a, a fan and in the position I'm in now, I look at it as if, if we can get consistency in the fact that as a fan and um, as a spectator, as anyone involved with baseball, if the technology is there and the fact that you're watching a game on TV and after you see a replay, holy cow, that pitch was clearly three inches off the plate. Or, man, that super close-up at second base showed that as he slid in and popped up, his foot came off. If, if we've got the technology that we can see all that at home, and as an umpire, you get one chance to see something that happens like that, it's really tough. So yeah. to, to be moving in that direction now, personally, I'm, I'm good with it, but – I understand that, that the kinks have to get worked out. If you remember, gosh, it was, you know, 10 years ago when we first started putting in place instant replay, um, you know, it wasn't perfect. Yeah. Uh, umpires were doing it themselves, going down the tunnel, looking at a small screen the size of, you know, maybe an iPad trying to figure out did that hit above a yellow line or not. And now there's a, a $30 million complex in New York that, um, you know, is the, the replay center. And, and they've got a system that's in place that's really working well with that. So I think they're going to get it figured out here. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised within the next couple of years that, that there will be something that's going to tell the umpire at home plate, yes, it's a ball, yes, it's a strike. You're still going to have to have an umpire down there to worry about check swings and yeah. um, it's the dirt and can bounce into the strike zone. The, the computer's going to read as a strike, but clearly it's not a strike. So, um, you know, it's just – but it's going to happen. If you would have asked me this a year ago, I would have said eh, maybe maybe five years or so. I, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at you know two to three years. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I, and this might be kind of looking too far into the future. Like you guys might not have this answer yet. But how like how fast would that be? Like the pitch is thrown, the catcher has it. Like what's like the reaction time that the umpire is going to get that notification? You know, we we were we were looking to have the the same uh, the same technology put in place this year in the Florida State League that they used in the Atlantic League last year, okay. and I understood. And we have we didn't even get to the training because we shut down before them. But it, it's relatively quick, you know, in the sense that that pitch comes in, a computer indicates to the umpire striker ball, and then he signals it. So it's almost in that same timing that I just explained it that it's you know, pitch, hear it, call it. So it's not much different than as an umpire, you should be processing it and watching it all the way into the glove. You just have to repress the urge of calling the pitch. Yeah. Um, so it was it was relatively smooth. I mean, if you see some of the footage from last year, you know, on occasion there might have been a delay. And like I said, this was, you know, this was the first time trying to use this technology. So there yeah. was a little, some issues with it. But, you know, 
keep the flow of the game going as smoothly as possible. That's what's important. You know, for catchers, I remember, you know, even now, you know, and I'm hiring now, you'll have a catcher if there's a three ball count on a batter, let's say it's three and one, and he's thinking the guy from first is going to be running. The catcher's going to say, hey, man, give me a quick one. You know, try and call it as quick as you can. Just that he doesn't want to throw ball four over the second baseman's head in the center field. Yeah. Um, there, there are small things that are going to have to be adjusted. And then think about this, too. Catchers, you know, part of the art of being a catcher is being able to, to frame that pitch without, you know, yanking it all over the place. And, and there's some good catchers that can somehow catch a ball in the, the bottom of his mitt, but it's right there at the knee and, and, and looks perfectly like a strike as opposed to a guy that's going to go down and, and yank it back up. So the art of catching is going to be different. And basically, you're just going to need a guy that's got a cannon that's, on his right throw down the second. That's a great Fly. point. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to change the game pretty dramatically. But like I said, if, if we've got this technology that can start figuring things out and we can, we can apply things consistently, you know, and MLB is going to figure out, okay, Aaron Judge is, you know, nine feet tall and Jose Altuve is four feet tall. Where does that strike zone meet, you know, in the middle there? Um, it's going to get figured out. And, and I'll, I'll put it this way, 10 years from now or 10 years after we implement an electronic strike zone, I don't think people are even going to think about it anymore. Interesting. Two points you brought up that I didn't even think about is the umpires having to like resist the urge to make that call, especially guys who have been there for like 10 plus years, 10, 15 years, because they're umpires that have been doing this, you know, for, for decades now. And then the catchers too, because, you know, as a catcher, like it is important to, to like to learn how to frame pitch and how to pick up the low strike or how to bring that, you know, outside fastball, you know, back into the zone. And you're absolutely right. It's really just going to be a more of a simplified position where it's going to be block and throw more instead of, you know, being like meticulous with how your glove moves and all that. So I think those are two very interesting points. Exactly. So now transitioning from your career as an umpire, um, what was that like kind of going from more like on the field to more of like the business side and working probably in an office or I'm not sure how you guys operate, but what was that transition like going from an umpire and now working on the baseball and business operations side? You know, I'll start, I'll start with this, you know, as an umpire in the minor leagues, I had eight years in the game, three were in triple a, I did get an invite to the Arizona fall league. So as far as the progression of being an umpire, I, I got, pretty darn far um and it it takes it takes a lot of ability and it takes a lot of uh interpersonal relationships and how you manage people to get there so with all that said i got i got released in in the fall of 2003 you know after those eight years and it was a phone call from major league baseball saying andy you're a great guy and we love you you're just not what we're looking for for the major leagues thanks and at 30 years old i was like holy crap what am i going to do for the rest of my life. So, yeah. you know, I, I went into sales, you know, I, I'm outgoing. I know how to, to, to communicate with people. You, you got to deal with that stuff. You know how to deal with rejection and negativity. So I went into sales and got some good sales experience. I was living in Florida at the time and just, just learned sales. And then uh, a, a few months later, while I was living in, in Florida, the development of the Atlantic League, Independent League, uh, baseball team in Lancaster, Pennsylvania was, was coming about. I was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And at the time, the president of that team was formerly the, uh, the, the uh, general manager of the Bowie Bay Sox. So when I umpired in, in the Eastern League in 99 and 2000, that, that general manager was there then, now president of the Lancaster Barnstormers. So I reached out to him in February of of 2004, a little over a year before opening day was going to be. And I said, look, I'm a local guy that knows that place. People know me a little bit from, from my time in the minor leagues and just, you know, newspaper articles or whatever it might've been. And um, I said, I, I want to come sell. I, I, I know how minor league baseball works. This is my hometown. I want to be part of it. So lo and behold, about six months later, they said, we're ready to really open up the staff. And I got hired. I got to be part of building a stadium and, and opening a team from scratch in my hometown um, and selling baseball. It's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it, it's a business and you got to hit numbers and you got to hit goals, but to go to these businesses in my hometown and tell them, look, this is going to be a big thing. And, and it turned out to be a great thing. We drew 
uh, close to 300,000 people that year. Fantastic season. Um, so with that, that got my foot in the door. And just to be part of that, you know, I was a corporate sales executive, but working in a, in a front office staff of 15 to 20 full-time people, you're also right. getting dirt and you're, you're doing stadium operations. You're doing things with groups. You're, you're learning the whole gamut of running a team. So that was great experience for me. And then uh, after a second year, the, the ownership sent me to the team in Camden, New Jersey, which is now defunct. But I did go down to Camden and, and work down there for another year. Um, there was a position that was going to open up on umpire development. And my former partner, uh, who's now the executive director of replay at Major League Baseball, Justin Clem, he was on the staff of umpire development and said, look, we're, we're looking to hire a guy. We worked together in AA. We worked together in Australia. Uh, we did some clinics together, and I think Justin just saw it as, you know, Andy's a guy that can do this. And then on top of it, my former umpire supervisors are still working with the staff, and they remember me as, boy, Andy's a, a good guy. He knows how to communicate well. He's, he's meticulous. He takes care of his business. This, this is something that could make sense. So lo and behold, after two years in that, uh, in that corporate side of, of working for two teams, I got hired by umpire development to supervise and train umpires. And right. it's a lot like you're out, you're on the road day in and day out in hotels, you know, traveling around the league, watching these umpires work, writing reports, visiting with them the whole nine yards. Um, I was doing that for three years and was fortunate enough then things were developing in the corporate office of minor league baseball in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, my current boss, Tim Brunswick, who is now senior vice president of baseball and business operations at the time, he was executive director 10 years ago. Um, the, the minor league office was going to take on the role of being the league president for the Gulf Coast League. Um, the, the, the farm directors and the directors of the Gulf Coast League decided that, hey, let's, let's, let's have this run out of the minor league office in St. Pete. Um, the, uh, the, the president at the time was very close to retirement. Tom Sapple was his name. And so because of the work I've done for umpire development, uh, I could write, I could communicate. They said, you know what, why, why don't we look to Andy? Maybe Andy can come in and work with Tim and yeah. basically start handling the role of the Gulf Coast League and then learning the whole baseball and business operation side of things from there. So that was 2010. And um, look, I'm the type of guy where it's like, give me something that you need me, need me to do let me learn how to, to do it. Let me use you as a resource to learn how to do it and then just keep growing. And fortunately I came in, you know, went from a part of element to a low level uh, there in, uh, in St. Pete and has grown to where I'm at today to being the number two baseball guy under Tim Brunswick uh, in St. Petersburg and, and connecting with our 160 minor league clubs. So, you know, to get back to when we first started, it's, it's a unique way with how I got my foot in the door yeah. But the key is to being able to find your way to get the foot in the door and do whatever work it takes to get it done. You know, a lot of our job seekers that come to the winter meetings each year when they get hired by a minor league team, most of those jobs are group sales jobs or, or internships. And of course, the pay is low and you've got you've to earn your money by making those sales. But if you can hit those numbers and hit goals and climb the ladder that way, on top of learning other skills from other departments, becoming a kind of a, a full-bodied minor league employee, the future is going to be there. Um, you know, Theo Epstein became a GM of a major league team at a very young age, you know, right around 30 years old. And it's inspiring for a lot of young people getting into the game, but it's incredibly difficult. And, yeah. and now, especially with the fact that the direction of baseball and scouting has turned to analytics and numbers and math and economics, uh, it, it's different now than it was even 10 years ago. So, you know, those guys that, that go to school to get that economics degree and get a math degree and, and, you know, that side of things to see how it relates to all the statistics that are kept in baseball now, it's just another way that, that people are now getting their foot in the door to get into to, to, uh, professional baseball. Right. And so you mentioned a lot of things there, but one thing that kind of leaks into the next question is um, like certain leagues that you were overseeing. And now you're kind of um, – also kind of looking over the Venezuelan and uh, a Dominican summer league. So I want to know what is the important, like 
I know is important and a lot of people who like, you know, who love baseball and who want to see it grow know it's important, but like from your perspective and knowing the game as a whole, what's the importance of those leagues and bringing players into the States and bring like the next like Ronald Acuna or Juan Soto or those kinds of players. So what, what do those leagues bring to the table for you guys? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And, and I can't say enough. Um, people don't know enough about the Dominican summer league. Now the Venezuelan summer league folded a few years ago. Uh, you know, the government is in such upheaval down there that, that, teams just didn't want to go in there anymore. So now basically the Latin American operations for all 30 major league teams are out of the Dominican Republic uh, and, and mainly in the Boca Chica area, which is right by uh, Las Americas International Airport. They're just outside of Santo Domingo in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, it is other than the draft and what we're able to get here in the States, because, you know, the major league draft is only open to United States in Canada. Uh, so if, if, if you're, you know, a foreigner, uh, you're a free agent signing. So this, these operations that are happening in the Dominican and, and look, they're, they're bringing kids in from Venezuela and Panama and Nicaragua and Colombia. And as the growth of baseball still continues to, to move in, in Latin America, I mean, yes, the Dominican, uh, Republic is, is the, the lifeblood and the center of it all. Um, but those complexes, you know, they are, they're housing, you know, 70 to 100 players almost all year round. You know, they're signing uh, players, whether it's to, you know, whether it's a $10,000 signing bonus or a $2.5 million signing bonus. You know, they, they're giving kids a chance to get into professional baseball. Yeah. They're obviously going to be taught the fundamentals of baseball. And, and these guys are getting signed at, at 16 years old and they're, they're moving from their parents' house wherever it is there in the Dominican, and they're coming to these complexes, which are turning into, I mean, just incredible, you know, $5 million, $10 million can get you some really amazing complexes down there. Um, and, and so the kids are given the opportunity. They're going to be trained. They're going to be housed. They're going to be fed. They're going to learn nutrition. They're also going to get their education. Uh, they're given not only just English classes, but they're going to continue – to get their education, to get their high school diplomas. You know, just because they get signed, just like here in the States, a, a guy gets drafted, there's still no guarantee you're going to make the big leagues. They're still going to do everything they can to help these kids get an opportunity to better their lives. Yeah. Um, it is really amazing. I get to go down there a couple times a year. I go down there for the opening day, which is usually at the beginning of June, and I'll go down for the All-Star game in the middle of July. And I'll spend a day each time going to a couple different complexes and just seeing, you know, how things are, how things are run and how these kids are doing. And yeah, there's, there's two sets of bunk beds in a single room and they've got a, a you know, a nice bathroom to share. But like I said, it, it's, it's modern technology and modern housing brought to them down in the Dominican. Um, it is, a, it's a great step for these kids at 16 years old to get signed and maybe after a year or two or three that they can develop then they'll get sent up to the Gulf Coast or Arizona League, you know, the, the bottom of the barrel here in the States. And then yeah. from way up from short season A to low A, high A, double A, triple A. Um, you know, it's you, a grind, though, for those kids. Like, it's a lot of years of development in baseball. And it's, it's like, it's definitely not easy. Like, because they got to start, like, from the very, very bottom and then work their way up to the bottom of the minor leagues. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, like I said, you know, kids are going to spend maybe a year or two, maybe three years in the Dominican Summer League, and then fall ball on top of it, you know, spring training and extended spring training. And, you know, the, the, the Dominican Summer League just runs from, you know, June, July, and August. So you still have nine more months in the year. You know, the, the kids are going to get time off for, you know, maybe two, two to three months, you know, and during the winter to, to get back to their families. But it's about, you know, teaching them the fundamentals. I mean, the athleticism that's coming out of most of these kids is, is incredible. But then to be taught the fundamentals and then shoot through the system, you, 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 you take a guy like Juan Soto. Um, you know, Soto played in the Gulf Coast League a few years ago and was our most valuable player at, you know, 17 years old. I mean, and, and you see him now in, in the major leagues. I mean, this kid is – heck, could he be better than Bryce Harper? I mean, think about yeah. what he's – this age and what he's done for the nationals and being part of a world series champion. Um, 
he was a he was a product of of being discovered down there, signed by the Nationals, brought to their their complex there, and he just developed so quickly that you know here he is now, an incredibly successful major league player, barely at the age of twenty one years old. Yeah, and I believe he was like he finished because um, like I there's a language school that they have to go to right to get them more fluent in English or Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Part of their that's part of part of being. Uh, signed with the team and sent to the complex that they're, yeah. you know, they at 10, 10 30 in the morning when they get done with the games and, and have their meals afterwards, they're in, they're in English class for the afternoon. They're in, they're getting their other studies in to get their, uh, to get their high school diplomas. But yeah, that is part of the key is that they're yeah. trying to teach kids English and teach these kids what it's like to be in America that when they finally do show up here from, you know, being in the backwoods of, of some of these towns down in the Dominican Republic, they don't want to have a you know shell shock of coming in the United States and going holy cow what's going on up here so yeah, yeah it's the baseball is only part of it you know the the language and the education is just as important as the baseball right so last question I have for you I want to know your thoughts on some of the rule changes and um and kind of the changes that may happen in the future and what I'm talking about is kind of like the DH in the National League. Um, bullpen guys coming out, having to face that three batter minimum, um, and just in general, like speeding up the game, you know, so it's more watchable. You can attract more younger fans. Um, and just before you start, like I know um, I'm a Mets fan, so I've always, you know, watched National League Baseball. And at first I was kind of against the uh, the DH of the National League. And now that's kind of, you know, like I read more into it and I'm just kind of like seeing it's coming. I'm sort of becoming more, um, more like friendly to that idea. So I, I want to know your thoughts on those kind of rule changes. You know, it's, I am, I'm a big proponent of let's modernize baseball, you know, baseball and attendance and viewership and it's, it's lagging behind other sports. And if there's a way that, you know, I, I think most importantly, and like I said, we have the, the pace of game initiative that was put in place a few years ago at triple a double a and the Florida state league. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, I go to a lot of, of games down here. You know, I live in Clearwater, Florida, I go to the Clearwater Thresher, the Dunedin Blue Jays, you know, when we have baseball and, you know, you get to a, a game that starts at seven o'clock, you know, during a weeknight, you get to nine o'clock, regardless of what inning is in and all right, by nine o'clock, I'm all right. I'm, I'm probably winding down. I'm going to head out here Yeah. You know, to have baseball games take more than, you know, the big leagues are, they're, they're taking more than three hours. We finally got it. You know, we're at about a 245 to 250 pace yeah. at play. We're at about a 235 to 240 pace at the Florida State League. They have a little bit of a shorter pitch clock, a 15-second pitch clock. Um, I, I just want to see something going on. Uh, I don't want to see a pitcher get the ball back from the catcher and walk around the mound. So we've got to, first and foremost, we got to do things just to kind of speed things up. So, you know, to, you know, with the pitcher facing a minimum of three batters, you know, especially you're watching a game on TV or said you're a Mets fan, you're watching a Mets game and, and you have a guy come in and, and he'll throw to one guy because it's left-hander and the next guy's up a right-hander. So now they got to bring a right-hander in and it's another, you know, two plus minute break. Right. Uh, going. Um, you know, the pitchers, you know, they, the, the eight pitch warm up that's the, the rule that's in the rule book doesn't really matter at major league baseball because you're not going to put, you know, the umpires aren't going to put the ball back into play until that commercial comes back, you know, you'll see him standing there on the side of the dirt waiting to come back from commercial. So yeah. if, if these things can help speed up the game and just keep it going at a, at a pace where things are happening, I don't mind a three hour game if, if there's stuff going on, but, but when you, you know, you have guys stepping out of the batter's box, you've got a pitcher pacing around the mound, you've got, uh, you know, you've got the catcher going to talk to the pitcher, then the pitching coach comes out, and then after a pitch, a shortstop runs in real quick. You know, those those types of things that are controlling the pace of the game, um, I think it's going to help. Um, you know, the, the DH and the National League, they're going to use it here for the, the 60 game season that they're going to start playing at the end of July. And uh, I, I'm, you know, the, the Players Association appreciates it because it's going to open up a few more jobs for, for guys that might be a little bit older that, you know, that, I mean, let's face it, David Ortiz couldn't play first base, you know, the last couple of years of his career the way that he could earlier, but the guy could still swing a bat. You know? yeah. and we still have baseball that can do that. So it's good for their part to give the players more opportunities and, 
um, you know, to keep them playing. But, you know, it's, it's, I think we're, we're at a, a tipping point here that, that baseball is realizing we have to do something to modernize it and get the interest of, you know, even people your age, you know, and, and to talk to a 10 year old kid or a 12 year old kid, you know, what do you want to watch? Well, I, I want to go out and play soccer. Um, you know, I want to watch football, uh, but baseball, you know, what, what am I waiting for? You know, you know, 30 yeah. seconds between is and, and guys, you know, scratching themselves and stepping out of the box. Uh, we got to find a, find a way to keep the game interesting. And I, I think that's one plus about what our, our minor league operators have done is that, you know, they don't control the baseball. The players are determined by the major league affiliate and our minor league operators, their job is to put on a, a, a show, you know, and, and the baseball is almost secondary. And we want people to have a place to gather with friends, uh, social spaces, places to have craft beers, places to have different food that you don't normally have, places for kids to run around and play. And, oh, yeah, by the way, there is a baseball game going on. But at the end of the game, as people are leaving the ballpark, you know, who won? You know, I don't I don't know who won because I was there also for all the other fun on top of it, too. So yeah. that is a plus of minor league baseball. Um, but still, you know, major league baseball is, is the one that has all the, the, the national exposure. And, and we have to just keep finding a way to keep it, you know, just keep it moving along because, uh, you know, the, the, the fan base is, is dwindling a little bit. Absolutely. And, you know, I think you, know, you guys will figure it out one way or another, whether it's you guys or Major League Baseball. Um, like, like you said, like the DHs and giving players more opportunities to kind of prolong their yeah. careers and all that. Um, but, yeah, that's all I got. And uh, this was great. This was really, really awesome. Uh, I think that this is probably one of the better conversations I've had. So this is I, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, just to, just to take it back, you know, earlier, you know, for, for guys like you and for those that might be listening that, Hey, I want to find a way to get myself into professional baseball, you know, be ready to, to humble yourself, to start at the ground level and work your way up. Um, you know, there are opportunities out there with teams, but it might mean, it might mean, you know, being an usher at a minor league ballpark to get started. But um, it is, it's incredibly fulfilling. You know, those two years I spent working for a club, it was incredibly long hours. Um, you know, you had to claw and scratch to, to get that commission to help on top of that, that salary that you had. But um, to be part of something like baseball and to work at a ballpark and have fans come in and out that were there just to have a, a night out with their family, a cheap night out with their family and have a good time. Um, I, I've been fortunate to be in baseball for, for 25 years now. I hope I got 25 more in me, and uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Absolutely. And, Andy, thank you so much. It was definitely an honor talking to you, and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. You got it, Nico. It's my pleasure. Best wishes to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Signing off.